Hey, this is Leo for Actualized.org. And in this video, I'm going to talk about what is karma. You harm yourself as dust thrown against the wind comes back to the thrower. That is one of my favorite quotes from the Buddha. And this quote gives us a really good hint and a clue as to what karma actually is. Karma is a concept that comes to us from the East. Really, it's popular in the Buddhist traditions. It's also popular in the Indian yogi traditions. So this dates back thousands and thousands of years to really the dawn of civilization in the East. And karma itself is a Sanskrit word. And I'm going to tell you what it means here in a second. But before I do that, uh, what, what I notice is that I notice that people here in the West, when they use this concept, don't really understand the subtlety of it. And they use it in a really ham-handed kind of way. So what I want to do here is I want to, I want to put the nuance and the subtlety back in the concept of karma. In the West, the way we use karma and the way we think about it is kind of like this. We think of it as uh, a universal law of justice. So that if somebody goes, for example, and robs a bank, which we consider an evil act, so they go rob a bank, and then let's say the police don't catch him and he gets away with it, then what we tend to think is that, well, karma is going to get him in the end. And by that, what we mean is that at some point later in his life, eventually the laws of justice will kind of even themselves out, just naturally. Because something bad will happen to that person. Somehow he deserves it now that he's going to get some other punishment for it. So maybe five years later, somebody will steal a car from him. Or maybe five years later, something bad will happen in some other aspect of his life and we'll say, ha ha, karma got you because you did something evil in your past. But this is really not how karma works. And this is kind of like a cartoon character version of how karma works. So I want to give you the more accurate, nuanced way in which karma works. And this is going to apply directly to your life. So it's not just about bank robbers and murderers. This is going to apply to everything that's happening to you right now. And it's going to explain a lot of why you suffer in your life and you're not getting the results that you want in your life. So this is worth understanding. Basically, as the Buddha was saying, every action that you take in life has a certain consequence to it. And bad actions have natural bad consequences. And these bad consequences, they don't have to come from the outside. The worst of them come from the inside. So the word karma itself, it's a Sanskrit word, it's an ancient word. What does it actually mean? Karma actually means action. Karma equals action. If you take away only one thing from this video, let it be this. Karma equals action. Now when you think about this, you might wonder, well, action, what does this have to do with justice and equality that we take karma to mean? Well, think about it like this, that your actions and everyone else's actions in life, including the actions of governments and societies and organizations, the actions of animals, and also just the natural actions of life, universe flowing, the actions of gravity and all the other natural forces that we have. These are all potentially actions. And every action has a consequence to it. So it's basically the law of cause and effect. Every effect has a cause. And life itself is just this giant interplay of actions. We can take the moment that you're born and we can take and stretch it out to the point that you're going to die and everything in between and we consider, we can consider that to be a series of actions. And these series of actions, basically one leads naturally to the next. So the actions you took earlier on will lead to certain consequences down the road as just a natural consequence of the way that life works. So recognizing this and applying it specifically to your life, what this basically means is that if you take good action, you will get good consequences. If you take bad or evil action, you'll get bad or evil consequences. Now all this seems fa fairly straightforward, but what most people don't understand is what actually good and bad mean here. It's very different than you might think. And I'm going to get to that in a second. The other thing that people tend to think about the law of karma is they tend to think that this is some sort of supernatural law. 
like they're some sort of old man with a beard sitting up in the clouds keeping tabs on everybody, keeping an account of who did how much good or bad stuff and then trying to even everything out for everybody. But that's uh, really not the way I think this law is supposed to work. This law is a natural law. This law is a psychological law where it really gets interesting is the psychology of it. It's so profound in the way that it explains how human psychology works. And it's also a spiritual law. And the spiritual part of it is understood when you really start to understand what the Eastern sages mean by good and bad, by good and evil. And here's what it means, and it's not at all what we tend to think here in the West. Good means selfless. These are actions that come not from your ego, but from your spiritual nature. Bad means selfish. You can also say that these are evil. Evil is not an objective thing out there. There's no devil sitting somewhere who's going to turn you into, into someone evil. What evil is, is something actually very mundane and very simple. And this is where it applies directly to your life. All this stuff applies directly to your life. Evil is doing things from your ego, doing things from your identity or from yourself. And now this... This one concept right here goes so deep that I want to shoot a lot more videos on it because it's going to be necessary, especially if you're interested in enlightenment work, which I'll be shooting a video on soon. Spiritual enlightenment, that is. But what this means, selfish acts. What do we mean by selfish acts? This is, uh, this is such an interesting concept to unravel. So, of course, we mean the most obvious selfish acts. I mean, when we think selfish, the common example that comes to mind, for example, is going to th Thanksgiving dinner and you, if you're sitting there, you eat all the food yourself, you take all the best food for yourself, you don't give it to anybody else, you don't share any of the food, and then the other people are left hungry at the table. Uh, clearly, that's very dickish and selfish. Uh, we also tend to think a selfish act might be taking some candy from a baby. Like, that would be clearly selfish and clearly evil and wrong. And that leads to bad consequences. Now, what are the bad consequences here? It's interesting because we tend to think that the worst consequences come from punishment from the outside. So, for example, if you steal candy from a baby, the baby's going to cry. Or if you steal candy from a baby, other people will think bad of you. Or if you take all the food at the Thanksgiving Day table, some people might get mad at you and start a fight with you. So, those would be bad external consequences. And if you take some action like robbing a bank, then uh, clearly going to jail would be uh, you know, a really bad consequence. But actually, the law of karma isn't concerned with that. What the law of karma is more concerned about is what's going on in here, in your mind. And this is the really most damaging part of the whole thing. You might think that robbing a bank, the worst part of it is that you get potentially sent to jail, but no. What's happening here, as the Buddha was saying, is that the dust comes back after you throw the dust, it comes back in your face. And so what's going on here is that immediately, as soon as you take the bad selfish action, what happens is that you already suffer the consequence even if you don't get caught, even if nobody sees you, even if the baby doesn't start crying, right? It already damages you on the inside. And why does this happen? And more importantly, you have to recognize how damaging this damage is on the inside. You tend to think and say, oh, well, you know, a little white lie here, or a little bit of getting angry at someone here, or doing a little bit of, a, you know, something here isn't going to cause too much damage to me on the inside as long as I can avoid the external consequences. But actually, no. See, what we're talking about here, and uh, what the Easterners were talking about, is the, the, uh, the carrying through of the cycle of selfishness that your entire life basically is, right? When your actions come from yourself, promoting yourself, defending yourself, fighting on behalf of yourself. These are all selfish actions. And what we mean by this is you, right? When I'm pointing my finger right now at you, that's what I mean by selfish. I don't just mean when you take candy from a baby, but I mean any actions which defend, promote, or aggrandize you, the self your identity, not just some part of you, but 
all of you. So whatever your name is, you could say your name in your mind right now. That's what we mean by you. Now, any action which promotes or defends that, that's a selfish action and that's an evil action. And now this is a difficult pill for many of us to swallow, especially if you carry the ramifications of this through your entire life. Because if you do, what you discover is that, oh my God, my entire life has been about me. It's been very selfish and self-absorbed. And there's a lot of examples that I want to give you here because it's not just black and white like, oh, well, but Leo, I never robbed a bank. I never murdered somebody. I never took candy from a baby. And I never did anything bad at the Thanksgiving Day table. But see, those are really easy black and white examples. And it's easy to point at those and say, ha, that person is bad because he did something clearly wrong. But see, there's a, a much more subtle element to evil that lurks in your life and you're doing it every single day. And what you have to realize is that today, just today, you already committed many, many evil acts. And karma is getting you because of this. The way karma gets you is something like this. So let's say that this bank robber, he robs a bank and he gets away with it. And let's say he goes to some tropical island and now he's chilling on the island. He's just living there. Now you might say, well, he got away with it. Maybe karma will get him five years later by something going wrong with him. But no, karma already got him. See, because in his mind, this is a selfish person. The act originated from selfishness. It's not like the person just did something evil and that was an isolated example. No, what's happening here is that actually his selfish nature is causing this person to do evil acts. Now, why is his, na his uh, uh, nature selfish? Well, because he's unconscious, he doesn't really understand what he's doing with his actions in life. So as you get more conscious, you realize that you unwittingly commit evil and evil is promotion and defending of yourself. So in this case, because this person was imagining how great of his life could become if he robbed a bank and had millions of dollars, so he went and he, he, um, he did this evil act to promote himself, right? To secure himself at the cost of others. That's an evil action. That's a, uh, a very clearly evil action, just from a societal standpoint, because we have laws against that stuff. But then there's a lot of evil actions that we take that we don't have laws against. But nevertheless, it gets you. And the way it gets you, like for example, with this person, you might say, well, he got away with it. Now he's sitting on the beach sipping pina coladas, his life is great. But actually, that's not the case at all. See, the kind of person that went out and robbed a bank, uh, that, that's not like an isolated example. This person, is coming up with these actions because he's screwed up on the inside, because he's unconscious on the inside. And so you have a chain of this. And this is what we mean by karma, is this perpetuating chain of selfishness. And the punishment is not jail or someone yelling at you or a fine that you get. The punishment is suffering. The emotional suffering and distress that this person experiences in life. Because even though he got away from, from this bank, in the back of his mind, this person, he's always going to be afraid now. He's always going to be looking over his shoulder. Are they going to catch me tomorrow? Maybe they won't. But see, he's going to suffer for that. He's also probably going to feel some sort of remorse or guilt. He's also probably going to feel out of integrity with himself because he's not following his own principles. He knows that robbing a bank is not right, but he did it anyways because he knew that it would make him feel good. But see, he didn't calculate the suffering that would come after the fact. And of course, you might say, well, Leo, he can suppress that stuff. And what if he's not going to feel guilty about it? And that's true. You can suppress that stuff. But still, it seeps out, right? You can't suppress it forever and you can't suppress it in all the, uh, in all the ways that it's going to come back and get you. And the way in which it gets you is the fact that, well, just by the fact that he did something selfish here, something so obviously selfish, this is going to create a habit of selfish behavior. So now even though, let's say he says, I'm never going to rob a bank again, and he never does, okay, that's fine. But the selfishness is still going to be within him. And the point, the problem here is that he's not recognizing that he's doing selfish stuff. He's not admitting it to himself. And so this is where a lot of the harm comes from. So now he's got all this money and he might go do something else selfish. He might be selfish in his relationships with his girlfriend. And that relationship might go sour because of that. And so he might have a string of bad relationship throughout his whole life because he's being selfish there. He's not recognizing it. And then maybe he goes and he does something else selfish. Maybe he goes uh, partying with his friends and then there they have a fight because uh, they're not able to agree on something. And so he has a fight with his friends. 
and his whole life is very turbulent and there's a lot of suffering because he's not able to get along with his friends or his girlfriend or his potential wife or other aspects of his life. Um, he feels now that he needs pleasure from this money that he's got. What if the money runs out? How is he going to feel then? So the selfishness just uh, keeps perpetuating itself. In the end, if you want to stop this cycle, what you have to do is you have to apply conscious awareness to see that what you're doing is selfish. And uh, this is not easy to do. It's easier to do in very black and white cases, but it's hard to do in more subtle cases. Which brings us to the point of you. Because we've been talking about this extreme example, but what about you right now? See, the fact is, is that you commit evil, selfish actions all the time. And an example of this might be, for example, the way that you get jealous towards people. Maybe it's not even something that you verbalize. Maybe it's something that is just in your mind, a thought that you have. The thought itself can be an evil action. You don't actually need to go do something evil. So maybe at work, you're a little resentful and jealous because one of your coworkers is better than you at some of the tasks there, and he's likely to receive the next promotion. Or maybe you find out that one of your coworkers earns a little bit more than you, and so you get, you get mad, you get jealous about that. Maybe on your drive to work, you get upset at somebody and cutting you off on your way there. Or maybe you get mad at your girlfriend or your wife or your husband. Or maybe you criticize people all the time. Just in your head, maybe you don't even say it, but you just criticize people. You see someone who looks funny and you, you judge them, criticize them. You see someone doing something stupid, you judge them and criticize them. Or maybe what you do is you manipulate people in subtle ways. Maybe in your relationship with your friends, you try to manipulate them and you play little power games and you try to be the one that's the best in your fr circle of friends. Or maybe with your girlfriend or with your boyfriend. You try to manipulate them in very subtle ways that you don't even admit to yourself as manipulation, but you do, you do this manipulation. And why are you doing this? You're doing this because in the end, at the very core of it is that you're afraid and you need to protect yourself, right? Remember we were talking about you, that identity, you, the ego? Well, the you feels like it needs to live life protecting itself all the time. This has been the case for you from the moment that you were born up to right now, and it will likely be the case until you die, is that you'll be living this self-survival mode all the time, where it's always about self-protection and self-aggrandizement. So it's, how do I make my, myself a little bit more money so I can feel a little bit more comfortable and more secure? How do I find myself that husband or wife that can make me feel a little bit more secure? How do I get that house or that car that's going to make me feel a little bit more secure? How do I get that better career promotion or that improvement in my business so I can feel a little bit more better and secure about myself. How can I improve the way I look, the way I dress, the way my teeth look, the way my hair looks? How can I improve all that so that I'm a little bit more secure? See, it's always about making yourself a little bit more secure. And that's why whenever anything comes into your life that threatens this security, then you get afraid, you get angry, you get manipulative, you get critical. All these negative things start to come out and you suffer because of that. This is a very deep truth, but um, this is something I'm going to cover in my spiritual alignment video. But the problem at the very center of all this, this karma stuff, is that there's this identity that thinks that it needs to be protected. The you. The you. And fundamentally, this identity is false. It's really an illusion. It's, uh, it's created out of thoughts and concepts. It's not part of actual physical reality. And so because of this, your entire life is basically... Uh, this giant drama of trying to protect an illusion which always feels insecure because at the center of it, it's hollow. There's nothing solid there. It's completely hollow. And so because of this, you have your perpetual cycle of uh, suffering in life. And uh, one thing that we tend to think about life is that, well, life is pretty hard. Life is challenging. Life is difficult. Life is full of negative emotions. And life is full of drama. And it's full of pain. And this is just how life is. Well, what's interesting is that that's not actually true. Life is that way for 99.9% .9 of people because they're behaving selfishly all the time and karma is always nipping at their heels. That's why that is. The punishment for karma is suffering on the inside. It's not external punishments, although you know those can be bad too. 
but it's the uh, inner punishments that you get. So for example, when you get a little bit jealous at that coworker of yours, what's the internal punishment? The coworker might not even ever find out that you got jealous at him, but the internal punishment is that your mood is soured. Now you feel passive aggressive towards him. Maybe on your drive to work, because you're thinking about how angry you are at him, you cut somebody off. Or you come home and you snap at your wife or your husband. Or you snap at your kids. Or maybe you perform worse at work. Because instead of focusing on your work, what you're doing is you're thinking about this, these colleague of yours who's doing better than you and getting paid better than you. And you're jealous of it. See, it undermines you. And because you're behaving in this selfish way, See, what's happening there is that you're trying to protect yourself. It's like, oh, me, 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 me. Why isn't it, why isn't it me who's in the po nice position that that employee has? Why isn't it me? Why is it him? And so because of this, you're so focused on yourself that your whole life becomes this cycle of being focused on yourself. When you're focused on yourself all the time, then what happens, you might think that, well, Leo, what's wrong with focusing on myself? This is how I survive. Life is kind of a dog-eat-dog -dog world. I got to survive, don't I? Well, the problem is that you don't need to actually put so much attention into your survival. When you put so much attention and effort into your survival, you become blind and unconscious to the way that this survival cycle is actually damaging your life, and it damages your life. It makes you unable to have a peaceful, calm, happy life. You're not able to be happy because you're always looking over your shoulder. You're always afraid of what's going to happen to you. You're always afraid that this hollow illusion that you're defending is somehow going to be found out by somebody else. And so you're afraid of it and you're protecting yourself and you're putting more and more layers over this illusion so that it feels a little bit more real. But that's a battle that you can never win. And in fact, not only are the bad actions that you're doing and bad thoughts that you're having uh, contributing to this cycle, but even some of the stuff that you would think is good. So it's pretty obvious to you probably that when you get angry at somebody, that's probably uh, hurting you psychologically on the inside and when you try to manipulate people, or when you criticize people. But even good stuff, so for example, have you ever contributed to charity? Or have you ever given a couple of dollars to a bum on the street? But the reason that you did that is not because you were doing an honestly selfless act, but instead what you were doing is you were masking this uh, selfishness in a veneer of selflessness. So what does that actually mean? Well, you go do some charity because it makes you feel good, or because it gives you a good reputation. Or you give that bum some money on the side of the street, because if you didn't give it to him, you would feel awkward on the inside. And so because you don't want to feel awkward, again, you're protecting that, that self, that you, you don't want to feel awkward, or you don't want to be a, a person who doesn't give to charity, because you don't like those associations, what you do is you give to charity, but you give it kind of reluctantly. You don't really give it selflessly, you actually give it selfishly. And in your mind, you're telling yourself, oh, I'm doing good, I'm doing good, I'm doing good. And see, when you say that, oh, I'm doing good, look at me, look at how good I am. Even if you don't tell anyone, you just give someone a dollar at the, on the street, you don't tell anyone about it, but on the inside, you tell yourself, oh, I'm a good human being. Well, what you're doing there is you're building up this, this ego of yours. You're building it up. And make no mistake about it that when you do that, you're going to suffer for it. Because of this ego now, you have to carry that around with you wherever you go. Every interaction you're in, when you go into your, into your marriage, that ego is going to be there. And guess what? It's going to be that inflated ego that you got from giving that, that person on the street a dollar and feeling good about yourself for it, patting yourself on the back. And then that creates problems, more and more problems, and it just creates this cycle of karma. And so there you have it. <sighs> the real punishment for all this is basically hell. In the West, we have a Christian notion of hell, which is hell somewhere out there in another life. But actually, that notion is not what hell literally means. That notion of hell, where did it come from? It came from the actual hell, which is here for you right now. You have the hell. You're living in hell right now. Hell on earth. That's what your life is. It's a life where you're unable to actually have true happiness and peace of mind. You don't have true peace of mind because you're always stressed and anxious all the time. You're always secretly angry at someone, bitter at someone, trying to manipulate some circumstance. Wherever it is in your life, you're always trying to do that. And your whole life is that.
So this concept goes very, very deep and it's very, very subtle because you don't like hearing this stuff. You don't like admitting this stuff. Because the only way that it actually is effective is when it's not admitted. So it takes a lot of mindfulness work. A lot of what I call enlightenment work. Uh, stuff like meditation to start to see how you subtly manipulate everything around you in order to pr promote and protect yourself. And this is what we call evil selfless, selfish action. Selfless action, on the other hand, if you want to know what that is, that is just action without thought. That's what true spirituality is. It's action without thought. Why is it action without thought? Because thought, contrary to what we think in the West here, thought is a problem. Because your thoughts create the notion of you. They create the identity, the false identity that's constructed out of thoughts. So the only way to get rid of that is to get rid of the thoughts. When you silence the thoughts, you can still have practical everyday thoughts. So if you need to go buy some gas, or you need to figure out how to get to the grocery store, those are okay. But we're talking about here thoughts about you, right? The self-absorbed thoughts that permeate and predominate your entire existence. So how many times, for example, just today, just during the span of today, how many times did you think negatively about yourself or about what someone's going to do to you or how something's going to threaten you or harm you? How many times has that thought entered your mind just today? If you're self-honest, it's probably a dozen times at least if not more like 50 or 100 times. So you have to become more and more mindful of this because your punishment is hell. And make no, no, no mistake about it, right now you're living in a hell. And what's bad about it is that you don't even recognize, many of you don't even recognize that this hell is here for you right now, that you're living in it. You're always afraid that hell is going to be out there somewhere for you. No, hell for you is right now. You're not able to be happy. And the other punishment that you get is kind of the opposite side of that coin, is that because you're in hell all the time, you're not able to experience paradise. Paradise, heaven. What is paradise and heaven? Again, that's not something up in the clouds somewhere after you die. It can be here for you right now. Heaven is the state of being spiritual, the state of having no thoughts, and the state of selflessness. When you get rid of the sense of self that you have, when you unravel that whole thing, which is basically what all enlightenment work is leading towards, then what you discover is that you can actually have true happiness right here, right now, regardless of external circumstances, and you can also have paradise for yourself right here. True peace of mind, because you're not caught up in this karmic cycle. And so that's what the Buddha is really talking about, and that's what the Eastern yogis talk about with karma, is that you perpetuate your own suffering and your own hell here on Earth. 99.999% of people do this, and if you want to turn this around, then you have to start to just become aware, simply aware of what's really going on here, how this karma is working. Because it can always so work in your favor. If you start to dissolve the self and you start to behave from a selfless place, then you get this positive karma building up and then you can experience paradise. So it's really that simple, uh, but you have to see how nuanced this is. You have to see how deep this rabbit hole goes. We could talk about this for hours hours and hours and hours and all the subtle ways in which you manipulate yourself to perpetuate your neg negative karma cycle. But that's it for now for here. I'll cover it more in other videos. All right, this is Leo. I'm signing off. Go ahead, post me your comments down below. I'd love to hear what you think. Click the like button, like this video, share the video with a friend on Facebook, and finally come sign up to my newsletter right here at actualize.org. It's a free newsletter. I release new videos every single week. I also have a lot of cool stuff for my subscribers for signing up, bonuses and such. The reason I want you to sign up is because I'm delivering new videos about how to master yourself, your own psychology, how to understand yourself at extremely deep levels. If you want a really fulfilling life, you have to do this work. This is not just going to happen spontaneously for you. And what I've also discovered is that it's difficult to do this work. It's not just enough to hear it once or twice. What you really have to do is you have to keep on track with it. And part of the mission of Actualize.org is not only to introduce these concepts to you, which I'm doing in these videos, but also to have these videos kind of guide you and keep you on track when you get off track. Because what happens a lot of times, you, you get unconscious for a couple weeks, a couple days, a couple months, maybe a couple of years, right? And then something clicks and you're like, oh, I need to get back on track. And you get back on track. But see, 
if you have nothing holding you on track, then a lot of times you can wander off, lose out of time. Well, with these videos, if you watch them every single week, then they'll help you to stay on track. All right, go ahead and sign up. It's free.